frightening and yet romantic characters of all time tonight in John Badham's Dracula. All month we've been watching the Dracula films and this is the most recent and I think one of the best made of all of them. With us tonight is John Badham, the director of the film. He worked his way up from the Universal Mailroom and Tour Guide jobs through uh, being one of their top television directors and now has directed such features as Saturday Night Fever and Dracula. John, thanks for joining us here. Oh, thank you for having me. Did you do a lot of research on the Dracula character, or were you well versed in vampires and all beforehand? I think I wound up reading so many books, stacks of books, on, and, and they all contradict each other. All, all Dracula vampire legends give you different, different scoops on how to get rid of vampires, <laughs> the way vampires act, and apparently they've been around since uh, really uh, prehistoric times. There, there are legends uh, coming from the very beginning of, of history. Uh, and, in, and in Greece and China and India, and everybody has their own, their own vampire stories. Well, in going into doing the film Dracula, uh, what route did you choose? Well, we decided to stick with, uh, with the Bram Stoker novel, and we try to do a faithful adaptation of that novel. As, as we thought it had never been done. And as Rick Richter and I worked on the script, we began having better ideas and, and little changes started developing. So our faithful adaptation became a whole other uh, sort, of, sort of approach, but, but springing from that Stoker novel. Now I assume, because Frank Langello is the star, uh, that the project came out of the Broadway play in which Langello also played Dracula. Uh, is that the case? Yes. And what, what Rick and I saw in the Broadway play was a highly romantic character and a man who had a tremendous presence on, uh, on stage. And we thought we could, we could get on, on screen and we could make a very romantic movie. And, and this whole picture is really based on an idea that that looks at the beginning of Dracula. Where did Dracula come from? What's the reason for Dracula? Right. Now, the reason for Dracula, I think, is it goes back to the devil. And all of these things deal with fights between God and the devil. And who's going to get the most souls in heaven or in hell? And so the devil decides that he wants somebody on earth that's helping, you know, he's a recruiting agent. Right. Sending, pe <laughs> sending people down there. Now. The devil's a very clever fellow. He's very smart, and uh, he's not going to send some weird guy up there with pointed ears and <laughs> fangs and a raincoat. Uh, you know, I mean, how many people are you going to get that way? Much better you send Robert Redford out uh, or Frank Langella. And, and so you have somebody who's very romantic, very tall, very good looking, uh, very erotic, somebody who can get girls. And, uh, or men, or whatever, whatever the whatever the case is, and um, and that's really the approach that we took in in, in in designing this this particular script. Now, your involvement in the film, I guess, would date back. You did several of the night gallery shows, yes. Rod Serling's night gallery, but your biggest success was in Saturday Night Fever, a disco, rock and roll, John Travolta youth movie. And the change between those two films, to go from Saturday Night Fever to Dracula, is an odd one. How did that come about? It's a very exciting kind of change to do. The picture I did before was called The Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, which was the story of uh, black people playing baseball in the 1930s in, in, the, uh, in the Midwest. And that change to uh, Saturday Night Fever was also a big change. Right. It's, very, it's very challenging for a director to, 
to shift gears so radically. And I learned when I was doing television, as I got trapped into doing, say, several episodes of The Bold One or something like that, that I was doing the same medical show week after week, right. and you were using your same tricks. You weren't thinking hard. You weren't uh, being challenged. Whereas if, if you suddenly had to shift gears and go over and do Night Gallery or Kung Fu or whatever I was, I was doing at the time, that it was much more exciting and much more fun. So something like this to go from Saturday Night Fever to Dracula is, uh, is a complete change in style. And, uh, and one is a street romantic story. And this is a, a, a much more traditional, old-fashioned romance. That's one of the uh, different aspects of this Dracula film, is the romantic aspect. Was that something that uh, was a carryover <laughs> from the Broadway play? <laughs> only hinted at in the Broadway play, I think. And because Langella has that kind of a demeanor to him, the, the Broadway play took a much lighter approach and was much more campy. And the Edward Gorey sets, which are wonderful, <clears throat> really don't translate to film at all. Edward Gorey uh, is, is an artist who does black and white pen and ink drawings. And all the sets right. were these wonderful black and white pen and ink drawings. The, uh, uh, the, the bookshelves, for example, were just painted books, on a, uh, obviously painted, just black and white. Now, you can't do that in film. Um, that kind of, that kind of uh, style is not going to work if you have to cut outside to a real English countryside mm -hmm. and cut back inside to painted doorways, painted books, and things like that. Uh, you've got a real stylistic problem, so uh, we went with a much more realistic kind of thing and much less campy in the way that the actors approached it. The temptation to be campy was probably very great. Dracula has been around so long, everyone is so familiar with the character, it would have been easy to do what, what they did with King Kong in the remake of that film a few years ago. But you resisted it. There is humor in this film of Dracula, but it seems organic to the film. Do you want to talk about that temptation? Well, the, the decision was made very quickly that if there was going to be any humor in the film, it was going to come out of the characters. If Dracula was funny, it was because he made a joke about himself, had a sense of humor about himself. <clears throat> if uh, Dr. Seward, the Donald Pleasance plays, is funny, it's because the character is a buffoon and is a glutton, and, and a lot of humor is built into the character, and we're not ladling on jokes for joke's sake. Uh, when Dracula says, uh, no thank you, doctor, I never drink wine, mm -hmm. it is a kind of self-mocking joke that he is making, and he appreciates the joke, and right. no, one else, no one else in the room does, and, and he's letting the audience in on on this, this kind of a joke. On a line that everyone is familiar with, one of the great lines of the genre. Well, you, you would strangle me if I had not put that line in the movie. You'd say, <laughs> why didn't you do that? Right. Dummy, the best line in the movie. Now, I'd like to talk a little <clears throat> about the special effects without uh, giving too much away. There are some incredible special effects in the film. I know Al Whitlock did some matte paintings. It was just beautiful. Roy Arbogast, mm -hmm. his work. Roy Arbogast we brought from here, who is, he's worked uh, on Jaws and Close Encounters, uh, and is, is a wonderful young special effects man, and he supervised the English crew with so many ingenious devices that, uh, that he came up with uh, to, to do a lot of the effects of, of Dracula crawling down the wall head first and creepy, very creepy scene. And leaping out the window and changing into a wolf right in front of your, your eyes. And a lot of very uh, ingenious devices that, that no one had really tried. And he worked somewhat with Al Whitlock, who has about 10 matte paintings in here, some of which are so marvelous, and yet they go by so quickly. Right. Because the story is going very fast at that point, and you can't labor on it, and yet I would love to be able to run up to the screen in the movie theater and say, look at this terrific painting, isn't it great? <laughs> Freeze it for a minute. <laughs> Freeze it. But Whitlock was, uh, would take a, an English countryside that was now all changed in 1978 um, 
and, and put it back into 1913, the period of this picture. And he would continue the natural elements there and, and then paint in his own and even start putting in little stone cottages and, and smoke coming out of the chimneys. Oh, he would beautiful. paint all this in. Then he would have the, the <clears throat> clouds animated going over. And things are always happening in a Whitlock painting. It's not just a static painting, and so it's alive. And uh, uh, the, the work is, is wonderful to, to watch. Well, now I know the film was made in England. Was that for budgetary reasons or for the locations? It was made because of the locations, which you can't duplicate here. You can't get the English actors. Uh, and, and also, uh, there's, there's a quality of set construction which the English know how to do uh, it, that is, is really not matched here, especially in this sort of period, period thing. You brought along an award that you received for Dracula. Uh, can we get a good shot of this? I guess we have one here. Can you tell us what this is? Yes, this is the grand prize of the Ninth International Festival in Paris for science fiction and fantasy films. And this is the only one uh, of its kind. There's a, a sculptress in Paris that makes a different statue for them every year, casts one of the statues, and then breaks the mold. Beautiful. And so this was very carefully carried over for us from, from Paris and given to uh, Walter and Marvin Mirish and myself to have. And we now have it in, in uh, joint custody, shared custody. Right. It's the Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> We just have a few moments left, and I'd like to talk about any future projects you have coming up, uh, if you can. Well, I'm, I'm very reluctant to talk about, about future projects. Uh, just about the time you finish talking about them, you can turn on <laughs> your television set, and there it will be. Someone will have ripped it off. Uh, and it, it, makes you, it makes you very uh, cautious about the kind of projects that you're going to talk about. But I am involved in in one particular uh, film that I that I hope we're going to make in the uh, in the summer of 1980, which is called Deal of the Century, which is a black uh, comedy, very mm -hmm. much like a Doctor Strangelove sort of comedy about a little guy who's got a uh, a warehouse out on Satakoy that he has used machine guns and used boots and cots and army things, and he sells them to Uganda. Uh -huh. and, and guerrilla guerrilla groups in South America. And it's a very funny, wild kind of comedy about a, a little salesman who's in way over his head. Right. Deep, deep over his head as he gets into selling uh, fighter jets to the dictator of Nicaragua. And, and It sounds great. Good luck with that project. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for joining us. And stay tuned now for Dracula with Lawrence Olivier and Frank Langella.